Very recently, and that is a paper that will be published uh, uh, on December in Nature Genetics, we found a, another unexpected discovery. We found a, in chromosome 11 another gene that modulates very highly uh, 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 fasting glucose. And this gene is a melatonin receptor too. And uh, for, for the, the, the travelers like me, melatonin is something you take uh, uh, for, uh, for your sleep and bec because you are jet lag and uh, melatonin is produced by the pineal gland and uh, no, nobody knew exactly what he's doing. And what is important, melatonin uh, is one of the most uh, uh, ancient hormones, uh, also pre present in plants everywhere, and is crucially important for the circadian and, se and seasonal rhythm. And to make a long story short, uh, uh, what we have found, and there was two other papers in, in Nature Genetics uh, about that from, uh, from colleagues, uh, the idea is that directly or indirectly, the melatonin pathway is controlling uh, um, uh, fasting glucose, and when you have a mutation in this gene, uh, it, uh, it modulates uh, the risk, it increases the risk for type 2 diabetes. So it might be indirect through the, through the, uh, the supracasmatic nucleus uh, control, and, uh, and the melatonin receptor is highly expressed in the eye, for instance, in the retina and the, uh, and the, and, and the optic nerve, and also in the diencephal but also it's expressed in the beta cell, and uh, we don't know yet how it works, but uh, clearly uh, it, it, it plays a role in glucosomeostasis. And that is crucially important that as a physiologist, I'm extremely excited about that because it's a, first, it's a genetic link. So it's a physiological link between circadian regulation and glucosomeostasis. So that means, and that is important because if uh, you have a bad sleep for several days, uh, and if I do OGTT, IVGGT on you, uh, I can promise you that your insulin secretion will be impaired. So there is a, a huge uh, uh, relationship between the quality and sleep and insulin secretion, and probably the risk to develop diabetes. Now, what about translational, but about drugs? So that is uh, the melatonin receptor two, and two drug companies, uh, Servi and Novartis, have a drug that has been uh, just approved uh, for the treatment of depression, and this drug is, uh, uh, is targeting the melatonin receptor one and two. So that's very interesting because uh, uh, there is a drug. And one thing is crucially important as well is depression and diabetes uh, are linked. So that means that uh, it has been shown and, and that, that uh, First of all, diabetic subjects are more depressed than the others, but maybe they have uh, good reason because they have a chronic disease. But it has been shown recently and published in the JAMA that they are depressed before they know they are diabetic. So there, there might be some link between the melatonin, uh, uh, which is also linked to serotonin, uh, and depression, circadian rhythm, and you know that uh, uh, some of the depression are linked to the fact that uh, that there is a, a lack of uh, of light during the uh, during the winter, not here, but uh, in the north of Europe, and the seasonal uh, uh, depression is quite imp are quite important. And by the way, this new treatment uh, from Novartis and uh, and also from Servia seems to be more efficient uh, for the uh, seasonal depression than the many of the other classical medication. So. You know, genetics, uh, the, the beauty of genetics is uh, you can be totally ignorant of most of the physiology like me, and one, and one day you have to learn that, and, uh, and that is one of the things I learned this year. So, from these studies, what, you, what, what you, we learn is, first of all, there are some of very, very important genes that increase the risk of diabetes, maybe at the later state of the, of the disease. But another way to be diabetic is to have uh, an uh, elevated uh, fasting glucose for, uh, for the first day of your life, or at least when you are young. And these genes that, that uh, are in the beta cell or play in insulin resistance, uh, elevating fasting glucose uh, may indirectly increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. And what an important thing also is to increase the risk of coronary heart disease. Because something that you may, you may not know is uh, people with uh, so-called normal fasting glucose, even a little bit elevated, so these people are here, they are not diabetic. 
70 percent of the of the of the risk at the population level of chronic heart disease due to glucose is not due to the diabetics it's due to these people so that's the situation here and i want to show you something before i finish is uh, uh, about the, the, the cumulative effect of the, of the genetic determinant of fasting glucose. So we found, and others found four genes modulating fasting glucose. You can say, oh, this effect is minimal, it's 1% for each of the, of the LL and uh, even less than 1% of fasting glucose. Yes, it's not very important. Now, if you, have, uh, if you carry three of these variants, and it's three of these variants, you reach 3.2 minimals, and according to, uh, to epidemiological studies, you increase already your risk of, of two times to develop diabetes. Now, okay, you are not lucky. You have six of these variants. Then you have 5.6 minimal glucose. And according to the American Diabetes Association, 5.6 is abnormal. You are not diabetic when you are not normal. You are in this gray zone where nobody knows what is your status. So uh, diabetes is very polygenic. Diabetes is complex. But if you analyze fasting glucose, with only four genes and probably some others, you already reach uh, a nominal lo level of, uh, of fasting glucose. So maybe the thing is a little bit uh, uh, less complex than people think, at least to determine the people who are really at, at a high risk to develop uh, uh, diabetes. So that is a situation of, uh, I think, about the diabetes, case control studies, uh, general population analyzed quantitative trait. Uh, that is for diabetes, and I have no time to speak about obesity, but uh, some very interesting thing that will be published very soon by my group uh, and, me and others about new gene for obesity. And all together, this kind of genetic studies uh, bring not only basic knowledge, but something that I think might be useful for translational research, uh, uh, prediction of diabetes, and development of, uh, of new drug. Uh, these kind of studies have uh, probably discovered about 10%, 15% of the genetics of diabetes and obesity, and the dark matter is probably at least 50%. So it remains a lot to do, and uh, there are many other ways to, for genetics to play a role, especially the copy number variation, and also the rare mutation uh, uh, that maybe play a role, especially in some population like here, uh, 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 which that population may have a specific genetic back background. So that's what we would like to do in, uh, uh, in, in this population here in Qatar. And yesterday you, you probably heard from, uh, from Dr. Howdy and Dr. Saud that there will be an Imperial College Center for, for Genomic Medicine here. And one of the, of the focus will be obviously diabetes. And that's the kind of thing we would like to do here in, 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 in Qatar, working in the Qatari trio and with a, speci a specific emphasis on gestational diabetes. Uh, we would like to have a reference Qatari genome, so sequence uh, the Qatari genome, uh, working uh, on copy number variation, epigenetics, and, and, and to have a kind of genomic bioinformatics to analyze more carefully all together. And we think that would be uh, a good way to, to make progress on diabetes, specific in this region of, uh, uh, of, of the Middle East. And that is a, a slide of uh, presenting the different kind of project we want to do in this center uh, and some of the key people to do that in this Imperial College Center for, for, for Genomic uh, Medicine. My point is that uh, you need to do uh, the, uh, the basic research if you want to translate something useful. Translation about nothing means nowhere. And uh, in this respect, I, I think academia uh, has a lot to bring, especially if uh, people from academia have uh, a very real, honest, and true interest for translational research. And I think it's what, is, uh, what really we try to do at, uh, at Imperial College. And you have here my colleagues. Thank you very much.